So we're back at our studio in our R code here working our way through our analyses. We have the box plot of effort um, scrolling and searching in a contacts manager. Um, and we just carried out that analysis with a paired, uh, a paired Wilcoxon signed rank test. But now we want to consider if we have three levels of our, our, uh, our factor. Um, and for that, we'll use a one-way repeated measures ANOVA. This is a parametric ANOVA. And we've done a one-way ANOVA, you'll remember before. But now it's a one-way repeated measures ANOVA, which indicates a within subjects factor. So we'll read in search scroll voice as our data table, that third level of our technique factor. Let's view that as we commonly do. So we still have only 20 subjects. Um, and we have technique, uh, search scroll, and voice. Uh, we have order, as before, one and two, where voice is always three. Now that would be a real challenge if we ran a study this way where we brought people in to do voice always as the third technique, because we might be introducing some confound there by having it always last. But perhaps in an exploratory aspect of the experiment, we might tack on a condition like voice, uh, maybe to test a prototype at the end of the study. Uh, we have the time that each of these takes, the errors made, and the effort ratings as before. So really, we've just added voice into the mix. Uh, we'll code our column subject and order as nominal, and we can do a summary over our table. You can see below. And as we often like to do, we want to see uh, a few more uh, statistics about each of the levels in terms of um, their mean and median. So we can see here, for example, that, uh, uh, that um, scrolling seems to be uh, the the longer, the slower of the techniques. Um, searching and then voice is a little bit faster than searching. Uh, is it fast enough to be different? That's the question. And we can do uh, looking at the standard deviations in the next output uh, helps us judge that a little bit. Uh, and we can look at our histograms as well. These haven't changed for search and scroll, but for voice as the new one, we can see uh, a lot of clustering between 80 and 90 there. And a box plot helps us see their relative position in terms of the time it takes to find a contact in the contacts manager. And we can see that uh, scroll seems, again, the slowest, with voice perhaps being faster than search. So a repeated measures ANOVA will test over all of these levels together. And if that test should be significant, uh, then we can look into pairwise comparisons. If the overall or omnibus test is not significant, we're not justified in, in looking further for pairwise comparisons. We're going to use the easy library, uh, and I've got some comments here in the code that help explain how this is working. So the easy library uh, allows us to uh, build uh, uh, this model M with specifying the dependent variable time, the within a subject's variable technique, and the within subjects ID as subject, and also the data table here. So we have a one factor, three level within subjects variable called technique. Uh, and we've, we build our model. And then the comment says we have to check our model for violations of something called sphericity. Sphericity is the situation where the variances of the differences between all the combinations of levels of a within subjects factor are equal or very near equal. It always holds for within subjects factors that have just two levels, so we don't have to worry about it. But with three or more levels, sphericity has to be tested and examined with Mockley's test of sphericity. These are some of the complications uh, and complexities that within subjects variables introduce. We'll see later when we use uh, mixed effects models that we can actually uh, model covariance explicitly, and we don't have to use sphericity to test for it. So we first check in our model here the Mockley output. If it's significant, it indicates a violation, and we have to use a corrected form of our ANOVA. Uh, here we do have uh, a p-value of less than 0.05, and that star means that that's the case. So we have a violation of sphericity, and we'll use a corrected output, which I'll show you in a moment. If there's no violation, we can just use the regular ANOVA. If there is a violation, we use the sphericity output, 
uh, and use uh, within that the greenhouse geyser correction. So first let's look at the ANOVA table uh, without correction. We can see an F test, recall it has two degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom in the numerator are two, in the denominator are 38. Here is our F statistic, and the p-value is obviously quite a bit less than 0 0.05. And GES is a, um, a value that tells us the effect size. That's called the generalized effect size. We won't go into that in this class, but effect size has to do with the strength of the effect. You don't want to interpret a p-value as effect strength. Uh, and so the, the generalized effect size um, uh, is a way of getting that. It actually, the GES stands for generalized eta squared. Um, and it compares to eta squared or partial eta squared, which are other effect sizes. But because ES uh, also matches effect size, I find that an easier way to remember uh, what it means. Okay, we're actually going to do some calculations here to compute the degrees of freedom for the corrected results. So we'll just do those and add that to this sphericity table uh, that's output from this easy ANOVA function call. So here's our table. And uh, again, we have technique as our effect. We know there is a sphericity violation, so we're going to use, there, there are two outputs here, the greenhouse geyser correction and the Hunfelt correction, the HFE. We'll use the greenhouse geyser correction. This is the greenhouse geyser statistic and the p-value that goes with it, obviously less than 0 0.05, so technique is still statistically significant for the F-test. Because there was a sphericity violation, if this wasn't less than 0 0.05, we wouldn't have a significant result. Uh, we'll ignore the Hunfelt results. We only need one set. And then here are the greenhouse geyser degrees of freedom in the numerator and denominator. And we can round those to the nearest, say, tenth. Uh, and that's what we computed uh, up above here. So we have the full data we need to report the result. So it's reported just like an F-test result, but with these adjusted degrees of freedom and uh, uh, the, um, uh, the adjusted degrees of freedom and the F-value from the original uh, effect table. Incidentally, the same uncorrected results in R can be given by fitting this model here, which you should be able to understand now, uh, and then summarizing over that. I'll just do that briefly. Um, but that wouldn't give us the sphericity um, test, the Mockley sphericity test, and so that's why we don't use that generic form uh, here. Now, because the overall test was statistically significant, we can reach in and do post hoc comparisons. And for that, we will use the uh, paired samples t-test, but we need a wide format table for that. So we'll use dcast, as we've done before, to make a wide format table based on technique, and we'll view that. So we have subject in the left column, and then scroll, search, and voice across the top. And we verified that, and then in the next three rows, we store up the individual paired samples t-tests, and then we adjust for multiple corrections and display the results. And we can see that all three results are statistically significantly different, um, uh, indicate statistical significance in differences among scroll, search, and voice, just like the box plot might suggest visually. So what's the non-parametric equivalent of a one-way repeated measures ANOVA? Well. Um, let's look at errors now for the three techniques. As we've said, errors often uh, aren't uh, conformant to the assumptions of ANOVA. So we'll do some looking at uh, errors for the three techniques here. We can see the means and medians there and uh, standard deviation there as well in that next output. Uh, and some histograms will give us a sense of the distribution of errors. Those first two by search and scroll haven't changed from before. Here are the voice errors. Those certainly don't look normally distributed. Um, and we can look at the box plots for errors, and we can see that, in fact, scroll still seems the least. And voice, although it seemed um, fast, uh, it was uh, maybe more error prone. If we go back to uh, a couple of graphs back, we can see this was the time things took, voice was the fastest, and we know that was a significant difference, but when we go forward here uh, and see errors, voice seems the most error prone. 
what we have in our hands here is a speed accuracy trade-off in human performance. That's very, very common. When people are faster, they tend to make more mistakes. That's not universally true. When we're comparing techniques, it may not always hold, but more often than not, that may be the case. So keep that in mind as you measure both speed and, and errors or accuracy. We can ask again, as we did before, are those errors Poisson distributed in this new uh, voice condition? So we've done a fit, and examining that, we see, in fact, that there is definitely no significant departure from a Poisson distribution. That will be interesting to us later when we return to this data and analyze it using a Poisson distribution directly. But for now, we'll do a Friedman test on errors. And again, we have the same syntax as we did for the Wilcoxon signed rank test, where we have errors by technique and subject as our uh, blocking factor across rows here. Um, and so the Friedman test shows a p-value that certainly is much lower than 0.05. Uh, and we might expect that in looking at the graph. That means the overall test of errors is significant. So we can reach in and look at the pairwise comparisons using the Wilcoxon signed rank test um, as our uh, pairwise test. We correct for multiple comparisons and we see that all of the results are less than 0.05, even when corrected. So with confidence, we can say all of the, the pairwise comparisons, the two-way comparisons here uh, between search and scrolling, uh, scrolling and voice and search and voice are all significantly different in terms of errors. As a completeness uh, item, I include another way to do this analysis with uh, the PMCMR library, and we, we reach the same conclusion there. Lastly, we can look at the Likert scale ratings. Uh, ordinal ratings, 1 to 7, also don't generally comply with the assumptions of ANOVA. Uh, let's explore that data. Uh, here we can see means and medians again for um, uh, how people rated effort, how hard or effortful was it to use these techniques to find contacts. And we can see that uh, the standard deviations look mm, similar, so the spreads around them are probably about the same. Looking at some histograms, we see the effort on a seven-point scale for search, um, for scroll, and for voice. Uh, they all look like se uh, they were more toward seven. Um, let's do a plot and see here where we see efforts about similar for scroll and search, but maybe a little more effort for voice. Perhaps it was, uh, we know there were more errors, so perhaps it was making voice recognition mistakes. Let's do the Friedman test on the overall effort ratings, and here we see an interesting outcome. The p-value is not significant, meaning there's not a detectable difference in the effort ratings on one to seven scale that people gave for these three different techniques. I have a note here for what that means. Since the omnibus test is not significant, the post hoc comparisons, the pairwise comparisons, are not justified. Um, if we would do them, we'd carry them out like we did for errors just above. Uh, so we know how to do that but we are not justified in doing that in this case. Uh, that's an important principle of these analyses to remember. So now let's go to our analysis table and take a look at where this has brought us. So we've just completed our analysis of the performance of subjects looking for contacts in a smartphone contacts manager using three techniques, searching, scrolling, and their voice. So we had one factor it had more than two levels. It had three levels, as we just said. It was a within subjects factor. All subjects did all three of those techniques to find a set of contacts in a contact manager. We used a one-way repeated measures ANOVA for our parametric test. And we used the Friedman test for the non-parametric test across all those three levels of the technique. We followed up uh, the one-way repeated measures ANOVA with paired samples t-tests for post hoc contrast testing. And for the Friedman test, when it was significant, we followed it up with the Wilcoxon signed rank test. Now, what happens if we go beyond not just two or three levels of a factor, but if we go into having multiple factors themselves. This will bring us to the factorial ANOVA and the aligned rank transform. 
it'll take us towards linear models and eventually generalized linear models, which will be next. <laughs>